We consider the modern era, the Cenozoic, to be the age of mammals, as their biodiversity exploded during it. However, to understand how the Cladive Mammalia grew to the scope it did, covering the skies, the seas, and land, we must first understand the origins of life itself. As life began and blossomed in the oceans of the Cambrian period, around 518 million years ago, a new frontier had opened up for life, dry land. The first vertebrates, animals with internal backbones, had evolved in the form of small fish, like Pycaia. Over time, vertebrates had gained traits which would allow them to better maneuver the land, such as stronger limbs and respiratory organs capable of breathing in air. These animals are often simply referred to as basal tetrapods, named for their four distinct limbs. These basal tetrapods are crucial for almost all vertebral terrestrial life we understand nowadays. The first basal tetrapods had emerged out of the water around 390 million years ago in the Devonian period, though were mostly restricted to swamps and more humid areas due to one large factor, their eggs. The eggs of basal tetrapods were similar to the eggs of fish and modern amphibians, and as such had to be laid in water and or moisture-rich environments. This restricted the expansion of vertebrates onto the new frontier, a supercontinent called Pangaea, which was the Earth's primary landmass. This prompts the next step in this age-old tale. One of the main traits that would finally allow vertebrates to expand beyond wet and humid conditions was the evolution of the hard-shelled amniotic egg. These eggs retained the moisture needed for embryonic development, allowing these new animals, dubbed amniotes, to populate a wider variety of climates. This trait will be notably useful in drier, arid climates later on in the tale of mammalia. From this clade, amniota, there are two notable groups that diverged. Sauropsids, reptiles and their close relatives, and the synapsids, containing mammals and all of their ancestors. These groups are distinguished by a key cranial characteristic, the number of temporal fenestrae, holes in the skull near the eye, that the organism has. Sauropsids have two temporal fenestrae, whereas synapsids only have one. One of the earliest known synapsids is the 50 centimeter long Archaeotherus which lived around 306 million years ago. While not much is known about the species, it can be said that this is one of the earliest ancestors of mammalia, though the two might seem quite dissimilar. Animals such as Archaeotherus would begin an age-old lineage withstanding the Carboniferous era all the way to modern day. From this point, the synapsids would diversify immensely with the dawn of more derived clades such as Ophiacodontids in the early Permian, around 30 million years later. Some of these Ophiacodontids would include the 2.5 meter long Secodontosaurus and one of the most well-known synapsids of all time, the 3 meter long Dimetrodon. Both of these animals boasted a notably large sail, which while the purpose of said feature is not well known, might have been used for sexual display to attract mates. It is also believed that animals such as Dimetrodon, while not assumed to be within possession of a full coat of fur, did begin to have skin more similar to mammals than basal amniotic, or reptilian, scales. Some other clades at this time were the Caestosaurs, one of the most well-known genera of which being Caudilorhynchus a massive animal with an almost comically small head in comparison to its spotty size and shape. Another example of a non ophiacodontid synapsid, one which did share a space with Dimetrodon, is the herbivorous Adaphosaurus. This animal also carried with it a sail, just as Dimetrodon did, though it is believed that this shared trait is only convergently shared, not divergently shared. Meaning to say that these two animals happen to evolve the same trait rather than it coming out of relation. It is clear that from the diversity of synapsids shown in the early Permian that they were highly adaptable, and this trait would help them for years to come. The therapsids would prove to be a key stepping stone in the Song of Mammalia as they are the clade with which mammals specifically belong to. The Therapsids, along with their earlier cousins, had diversified quite a bit as well, 
A few groups within the clade of Theracida are Dinocephalia, Dicynodontia, Gorgonopsia, and Theracephalia. The Dinocephalians, such as the 2.6 meter long Moshops, were well known for their stocky build and heads with large cranial domes. It is believed that, similar to the later Pachycephalosaurus, they would use their thick heads for cranial combat, perhaps even butting heads with each other. The Gorgonopsids are some of the largest and most recognizable therapsids, with some of their most distinct features being a feline-esque body and their striking sabers. In Ostrancevia, measuring between 3 and 3.5 meters long, is one of the largest known Gorgonopsids. Most Gorgonopsids were thought to be predators, with recent studies even proposing the idea that certain genera, such as Gorgonops torvus, were ambush predators. It is here where a key discovery in the evolution of mammals should be mentioned. In Permian vertebral coprolites, among numerous other findings, was the discovery of a hair-like filament, suggesting that the Permian therapsids contained hair or hair-adjacent coverings to some extent. This is specifically where the resemblance to mammals can be seen even further from the origins of Archaeothyrus. The early Permian was quite the thriving times for synapsids, but as the Permian went on, life became more and more inhospitable for almost every organism on the planet. This leads to an unimaginably important event in the tale of life. During the Middle Permian, around 260 million years ago, Temperatures on Earth were beginning to rise. This warming is not entirely known, but scientists believe that the primary cause of the massive temperature increase was volcanic activity in what is now known as Siberia. The constant outpouring of lava would decimate numerous ecosystems. But the most devastating aspect of this volcanic activity were the greenhouse gases being released from this seemingly unending Serbian range. The large amounts of carbon dioxide released would have clouded and choked the atmosphere of oxygen, and much of it was most certainly absorbed into the ocean, turning the origins of life toxic as well. This event is known by many names, the End Permian Extinction, the Permian Triassic Extinction, but one name is the most striking and accurate of all, the Great Dying. Reaching its peak at around 252 million years ago, the Great Dying killed over 70% of terrestrial life and a whopping 96% of marine life. It is believed in the end, an estimate of 90% of all life went extinct in the Great Dying, including numerous lineages that will never grace the earth with their presence again. The landscape went from diverse and forest-filled to a scorching wasteland cursed with sweltering heat. The Great Dying was by far the most catastrophic event for life as we know it. Despite this dire situation, survivors still remained, such as the synapsids. While many therapsids went extinct, one group of hardy survivors included the dicynodonts. One species in particular, the two meter long Lystrosaurus, were capable of burrowing and feeding on roots, allowing them to survive in the harsh landscape left in the wake of the volcanic apocalypse. In the aftermath of the ecological destruction, there was very little competition for Lystrosaurus, allowing them to proliferate immensely, it is believed that early in the Triassic, Lystrosaurus was so common that it made up over 95% of terrestrial life. However, this reign of absolute dominance would not last. As life in the Triassic began to recover, more species kept diversifying, and soon Lystrosaurus would no longer be able to survive in this newly growing landscape, and would go extinct around the early Triassic. This was not the end of Dicynodonts, however, as they kept diversifying and inhabiting new ecological niches. One species of Dicynodont, Lysoecia would reach elephantine sizes of 4.5 meters long and 2.5 meters high. The reign of the Dicynodonts would not last beyond the Triassic, though. There was one group of therapsids not previously mentioned that first appeared in the late Permian, and are a crucial figure in the tale of mammals. The Cynodonts. Cynodonts were rather small and adaptable, like the Dicynodonts, name unrelated, and were most likely covered in fur. The Cynodonts, visually speaking, can be viewed as a sort of linkage which shows us how the early lizard-like synapsids would evolve into the smaller mammals we know today. It is believed that the Cynodonts were endotherms, meaning warm-blooded, and also likely that they had large coverings of fur, setting the basis for the furry radiative forms of crown mammalia. If it has not been made clear, the Cynodonts are the direct ancestors of mammals and mammalia forms. 
They remain small, occupying mostly nocturnal niches and being insectivorous due to niches that larger animals, namely reptiles, were occupied in the Mesozoic. Basal cynodonts would live until the Cretaceous with the Tritolodontids, however, a specific group of cynodonts would have a massive part in this age-old tale. Before moving on to crown mammalia itself, the family before them known as mammalia forms should be covered as well. Mammalia forms are animals which appear too close to true mammals to be considered basal cynodonts, but cannot conclusively be considered true mammals either. As such, many mammalia forms on first glance seem to be true mammals, yet are not technically. This does not rule out the possibility that they are, in fact, members of crown mammalia, but are simply too ambiguous to tell for sure. The first members of crown mammalia would evolve roughly 205 million years ago, near the end of the Triassic period. To understand what really sets these animals apart, one first must understand what classifies a true mammal. Mammals are defined by four primary characteristics, hair or fur, mammary glands and producing milk, for which they are named after, a lower jaw hinged directly to the skull, and three inner ear bones to transmit sound. It should be noted that giving live birth is, in fact, not a requirement to be a true mammal, even though the vast majority of extant, meaning living, mammalian taxa do give live birth. It is believed that most early mammals laid eggs, and it was with the divergence of the first ancestor of the Therian mammals, the family that both placental and marsupials are a part of, that live birth became common. Another common trait of mammals that is not necessarily a requirement but has become a staple feature of them is sociality. The strong relationship between parents and young, as well as social groupings and interactions, has proven to be woven in the fabric of mammalia and could have arisen multiple times. Nowadays, we view sociality as standard in mammals. However, it was previously thought that they would stick to themselves while living in the shadow of the dinosaurs during the Mesozoic, only evolving during the Cenozoic. Recent findings now contradict this line of thinking, suggesting that even earlier in the Cenozoic, mammals sought out each other's company, setting a long-standing precedent for the lineage. Throughout the Mesozoic, referred to in conversation as the Age of Reptiles, while mammals would continue to diversify and fill new niches, they were still limited in size due to the competition of the gargantuan archosaurs, pterosaurs and dinosaurs, that dominated the ecological landscape. It was only after the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction, the famous meteor that killed the non-avian, meaning non-bird, dinosaurs, that mammals, along with other groups, could truly diversify. Mammals, among other groups, were absolutely not benefactors from the extinction, as it killed an estimated 76% of all life on the planet. However, the absence of dinosaurs did allow for mammals to finally grow out of their shadow. Mammals did not immediately begin to fill the earth in the beginning of the Cenozoic, however, soon after would come into their own and blossom into the diverse family we know today. One of these lineages, Cetacea, would even be home to what is currently known as the largest animal to ever live, Balaenoptera musculus, otherwise known as the blue whale. The story of how mammals evolved is a long one, spanning over 200 million years, beginning with the most peculiar lizard-like animals to the often furry behemoths we are familiar with today. While most are familiar with what a mammal is and are used to them in their everyday lives, relatively few understand the massive story of how mammals reached this point ecologically and evolutionarily speaking. It is important to understand our past in order to understand how to build our future. 